here of the Black Chicago History Forum is about remembering our history from our point of view. And he will tell it from our point of view, and even more so. Uh, and we're, while you're listening, you can look at the pictures of the former slaves and freedom collected from, the, like I said, the living descendants. Uh, then we have quilts of people who were, um, who migrated to Chicago, this quilt. All of these people on this quilt right here migrated to Chicago, and I'll tell you a little bit more about them later on. Okay, Dr. Reed. Okay, thank you. I uh, feel somewhat blessed because I know a lot about my ancestors. When I grew up, I grew up among the ranks of these people. This is my family, I'll pass this around from 100 years ago here in Chicago. The little girl is my mother, would be over 100 if you were that. These are three of her aunts, two of her uncles. This gentleman was in slavery, her grandfather, and he got his freedom by fighting in the Union Army, as did 178,000 other black men. And I always say, even if you didn't know the name of your ancestor who was fighting in the war, or even if you didn't have one, you still can lay claim to the contribution of the black soldiers, 178,000 strong, and 26,000 sailors in the Navy. If you didn't know the name of so-and-so, he was probably a cousin to your cousin's cousin. So we're all connected with this effort as we liberated ourselves. Now, I should say I feel blessed. I, I grew up under these people. I always tell people I sat at the feet of the masters who taught me how to examine the meaning of the question before I worried about an answer. I mentioned to Brother Young here that just recently a man asked me a question. I don't want to identify him too closely. This is being taped. Right. But he asked me, have you ever been to a country somewhere other than Africa? Because he wasn't of African descent. And I said, no, I haven't been to that other place other than Africa. But when I'm able to go somewhere financially, I'm going back to where my folks came from. I'm glad you know about your folks, but I want to go back to where my folks came from. And my folks were emancipated of freedom, free, family in this country by the year 1865. That's what we're here talking about, the last group that was free. That was the group in Texas. Hundreds of thousands of them. But you know, the story of freedom starts first with the thirst that the Africans had to get back to a state they had been in when they were in Africa. These folks basically were free people. So when they came over here, they were in an unnatural position. This was unnatural, leaving a state of freedom, going to a state or a status of being enslaved and under somebody else's control. The last wave or last stage of getting back to a free state occurs in Texas on June 19, 1865. But I just want to spend maybe 15 minutes talking about other waves of Africans that got their freedom before June 19th. And by the way, the Juneteenth celebration is a combination of June, the month, and the date, 19th of June, Juneteenth. Now, I, I, I say the first wave came when the people adopted their African religious ways to the new ways that they learned about over here. I talked to Reverend Kemp about that. So I had a note to myself that true freedom became a reality when they realized their spiritual nature hadn't changed coming over here. They had new names over here. Remember, Kunta Kente lost his name. And he even lost one of his limbs, lost his part of his foot. But he didn't lose his spirituality, which was just enhanced during this period of turmoil hundreds of years here. And that kept a lot of people afloat. And that's how I understand how these people 
were able to teach me. Highly spiritual folk. In fact, their institutional base was Olivet Baptist. They spent decades down at Olivet. One of our many churches in this city, and of course we had churches throughout the South and started sneaking having church services before slavery even ended, the invisible church. Then there was this period, another wave, at the, after the American Revolution in which our men fought. And be sure you see that exhibit showing our people fighting in World War I when you leave this session today. There was a wholesale effort to free slaves in this country, even in the South, in the 1780s, 1790s. And then the introduction of a machine that made it more profitable to take low grade cotton and process it and make money off of it came along. That machine, the horrible cotton gin, short for cotton engine, which was helped created by a black man who was working with a white man from New England who was trying to perfect the device to save labor hours. At that point, all the freedom in the world wasn't going to come to anybody in the South until the Civil War of the 1860s. But some people did get their freedom back in the 1780s, 1790s, 1800s. And many times it was a phony freedom because up in New York State, you could be free by July 4th of 1827. You had to wait in New York because those people were making money off of their slaves. So they said, yeah, there'll be no more slavery in New York State, but anybody enslaved now has to wait. In New Jersey, you had to wait until 1861. And there was no slavery in, supposedly, in states like Illinois, Indiana, Ohio. So that wasn't a real problem, except it was a real problem in that people would bring their slaves from Missouri or Kentucky into Illinois on a seasonal basis, which sometimes became all year long to work processing salt and other items in Illinois. You can make a lot of money in salt processing from salt lakes, salt licks. Technically, no slavery in Illinois. In reality, there was. Some of you probably remember from grammar school hearing about the Huckleberry Finn story and the slave Jim. And people started wondering, why didn't Jim ever escape from Missouri into the free state of Illinois? Because if Jim had come into Illinois, there was a $1,000 bond he would have had to post it. And Jim, and Jim didn't have freedom papers to get into Illinois. And without freedom papers and without $1,000, Jim was in the same shape he would have been in had he stayed in Missouri. There was nowhere to run, in other words. It was a false sense of freedom. Well, people took matters into their own hands because you know how dynamic our people are. And that's true, we are a dynamic group. So those people we know of as freedom seekers, or some of you were taught, runaway slaves, or as the whites call them, fugitives, which meant smart folk. Yeah, yeah, yeah you're very smart. <laughs> If, if you were a runaway slave. So these freedom seekers constantly were coming to places where they'd be free. That's another way. Sometimes they ran away to some of the Native Americans. Unfortunately, some of the Native Americans kept slaves themselves. For those that ran away to the Seminole people of Florida, you could join the Seminole. Some of the Africans became chiefs. Many a black woman takes the name of a Seminole chief, Osceola. Anybody know any women? in their family's name, Osceola. Well, he was a chief, and he had, a, he had an African wife, but there were African warriors, men who would run away from the plantations who joined the Seminole people. In fact, the presence of those Africans who had taken freedom of their own way before the Civil War provoked two wars with the United States government, the Seminole Wars. The United States Army sent troops, thousands of troops, to. Florida to contain the Seminole Indians with their African allies. In the end, after two wars against the Seminole Indians, the whole group was shipped over to what was called Indian Territory, which later became Oklahoma. The promise to the Native Americans, if they were shipped over 
It's either as Seminole or earlier or as Cherokee, Choctaw, Chickasaw, Creek, whatever the promise was. Or if you're part of Wyoming around Chicago, Miami, Ojibwa, if you were shipped over to Indian Territory, you could stay there for the rest of your life and enjoy your life without interference. You can guess what happened. Yeah. The whites moved in by 1890, 91, and they changed that to Oklahoma, and they started grabbing up land. Later they would have discovered oil. Before they discovered oil, they had taken over the land. So today you have whites in Oklahoma, you have blacks in Oklahoma, blacks that are part Native American and African in Oklahoma, and not everything is rosy in Oklahoma. Some people fled to Chicago. One, the good thing about Chicago in the 1830s, 1840s, 1850s, if you got here and kept a low profile and didn't go out at night, there's a good chance you could remain free <laughs> if you're a frequency. <laughs> and by the way, the bad part of the story is people were actually kidnapped off the streets of Chicago and taken back south and sold into slavery. And wow. you're talking about so. people. A man might be worth $1,000 if you can grab him and take him back to a slave state. A woman might be worth $800. A young man like this gentleman up here, Brother Jones, hold your hand up. $1,500. <laughs> Brother Barr, hold your hand. <laughs> $1,250. <laughs> <laughs> Now we're laughing about it, but this we have to laugh to keep from crying. That's right. how bad it was. Right. Men and women and children bought a good price, yeah. which reminds me of the slave master. Every child born in slavery belonged to the master, and that was something he could sell or trade. Every little child he saw had a dollar sign on his head. Mm -hmm. Old Thomas Jefferson, he believed that it was good to have Slave children working, at least by the time they were eight years of age. So anybody on his many farms and plantations in Virginia worked. And by the way, you weren't paid for it. The women, the African women were not brought over here because of their beauty to be exploited sexually. But once here, they so served a triple purpose. You could work them like you did men. You could take the children they might have had by you or by somebody and have them as an economic asset. Or you could just keep them for pleasure as Thomas Jefferson did. It's been discovered at his chief house on his plantation, Monticello, that there was a room next door to his bedroom where Sally, they called her the, uh, the, uh, the uh, Sable Venus, Sable being black. Sable Venus. That room was discovered and it become, they changed it over to a toilet, a bathroom in the years after he died. So you never would have known there was a secret bedroom next to his bedroom. That really was his second wife because his first wife was dead. And he promised his wife, hey, I'll never remarry. I'll never take another woman. But he had several children by Sally Hemings. Everybody knew about it, but what's hypocrisy in America? It's standard in right, America. Right, right. So we have people constantly seeking freedom as freedom seekers. Time went on and a war between white people started in 1861. What were they fighting over? Well not over slavery and ending slavery, but on the other hand they were fighting over slavery. It was of the right of the people in the South to keep our people enslaved because we were so valuable as workers who were never paid. Now there were always complaints about the slaves not working hard enough. If we don't work them hard, they won't work at all for no money. Insanity, sort of remind you of to America today. Yeah. Total insanity being here. So the war started, they were fighting to make sure that the North wouldn't be under the economic domination of the South and the South said, we're fighting the North because we don't want to be under the control of the North. Right. Each side had a reason to fight. And midway through the war, because there was a shortage of men to fight on either side, the North said, we're going to use black men as soldiers. That's how my great-grandfather 
got to be a soldier. That's how he got his freedom, he joined the army. Unfortunately for my great grandmother, she had to stay a slave for six months after he joined the Union Army. That's because the North was embarrassed having these men fight for their cause as well as for their own freedom. The embarrassment was what they say, we'll free their families too. In the six months gap between the time he enlisted and my great grandmother got her freedom, all the families of the soldiers in Kentucky were free to starve outside the gates of the forts where the oh, men were wow. training. Well, this is America. Yeah. You don't expect yeah. too much that's right. right. So we have black soldiers legally authorized under the Militia Act of 1862 and then finally by an event that we all know about that gave us our watch. Parties, Emancipation Proclamation. We didn't start watch. Watch was part of European tradition. But we took it over on December 31st, 1862. We stayed up all night in the north or places where slaves, where former slaves were free. We were watch, the watch service, waiting for what Lincoln to sign the Emancipation Proclamation on January 1st, 1863, which supposedly freed everybody. Now there were four million people enslaved. It didn't free everybody. Technically, it didn't free anybody. Because all the documents said, wherever the Union Army is, you remain a slave. If we've invaded the South, where slavery existed. Wherever there was a state that hadn't left the Union, slavery stays intact. The order was only effective in places where Lincoln had no power. It's as though I tell you, go home, expect in your mailbox a check that I sent for $1,000 printed on the Binger State Bank, 35th and State. And that bank's been closed since 1930. Jesse Binger, right? Yeah, that, was, that bank closed, 1930. Yeah, Abraham Lincoln needed an army, and the Emancipation Proclamation allowed him to raise a black army to give manpower to help defeat the South. And then the promise was all the soldiers and all their families and everybody they liberated could be free in the future. Of course, his real plan was to ship people to Africa or to Central America or down to Haiti, but get rid of them. He didn't believe there was a place for white and black in America. In any event, the Emancipation Proclamation uh, did give people a sense that something good was going to happen. So they misinterpreted the document. And as far as they were concerned, that was an incentive through their misinterpretation that whenever they had a chance, they would what? Become a freedom seeker. So if they heard cannon fire in the distance, meaning the UN Army, Union Army was fighting the Confederate Army, that was a signal, go ahead, you're gonna be free. Their misinterpretation was turned into a reality because they had the courage to make it a reality. They took their freedom as freedom seekers. Now, I wrote a book, and there's a good story in the book about a couple of families that did that, mainly from Alabama. Uh, man, woman, seven, eight kids in a place called Tuscumbria, Alabama, near Florence, Alabama, up in northwestern Alabama. Uh, the family fled to where the Union, Union Army was encamped. The women and children were put on the railroad and sent up to Chicago where they found work as domestics and in the service field. The son and the father were kept in Alabama where they were working for the Union Army until such time the Army had no need for their services. They did get their freedom. They were called free. They were what? Worked as though they were slaves for the Union Army now during the war to what you were taught was a time that the slaves were gonna be free. In any event, the freedom seekers were found throughout the South, taking advantage of every and any opportunity to get away from their Southern masters. Now, some people who didn't leave the plantations <coughs> exerted themselves as freedom seekers by slowing down in their work. And Brother Lorenzo Young, are you familiar with Dr. Du Bois' famous book, 
black, uh, black reconstruction. Right. He talks about the general strike. Right. According to Du Bois, the black people sat on their hands if they were stuck on the plantation. Right. Remember, if the Union Army was 100, year, 100 miles away, right. you know, you're not going to run 100 miles in one night or two nights with Confederates in between you and the Union lines. So they sat on their hands. That was called the Great General Strike. They slowed down. They had no incentive to speed up or to work at a regular pace because all they were doing was what? Serving the interests of the master. So that was another form of resistance and freeing themselves in such, until such time that they could benefit from their own labor. That's the key. The people in Washington were so embarrassed that they were selling slaves and trading slaves that in April of 1862, they abolished slavery. That was great. They abolished slavery for 3,100 people. There were still only 4 million enslaved outside of Washington. And so people in Washington started celebrating their Emancipation Day in, in, in April. So every year they have celebrations like the Juneteenth, but it was in April of every year. The point I'm making here is that throughout the South, people got their freedom at different stages, at different times. Finally, my great-grandfather and soldiers representing various units met Robert E. Lee head on, chased him out of Richmond, Virginia in April of 1865, and he surrendered on April 9th. Now I make up a little story. I don't know that this actually happened, but I know the records show my great grandfather was there when Robert E. Lee surrendered. But I, I walked the steps that Robert E. Lee walked. I went to Appomattox, Virginia, and I walked where my grandfather and all these black men were. Then I walked back to where Robert E. Lee was, and I looked and I said, "That's where they were." And this is all documented. This is not made up. And I said, "I bet," but I wasn't sure that Robert E. Lee looked out and saw these black men in blue uniforms with these white men in blue uniforms. Black men in the center of the battle formation and said, great Googa Mooga. <laughs> that's that's Reese Lord, his great grandfather. I surrender. <laughs> and that was it. So for most people, once the word got out that Robert E. Lee had surrendered, they figured they were free. So they started wandering away from plantations and the Union Army was chasing just remnants of the Confederate Army, so most folks thought they were free. And this brings us around to June 19th, 1865. Two months later, the white folks of, of, of uh, Texas over here, who had been resisting letting the Africans know that their status had changed, were unceremoniously told the to gigs up. 2,000 Union troops landed in Galveston, Texas, and they marched around to the plantations and forced the slave owners to read the proclamation that slavery was over in America. So the people of Texas, the last to experience legitimate freedom, said as of June 19th, heretofore to be known as Juneteenth, we will celebrate the day of our emancipation from freedom. And that's how you got Juneteenth. Now hundreds of thousands were free, and one of the things that the Union Army told the black people, now that you are free, quote, no idleness will be allowed, unquote. Meaning what? No idleness would be allowed? You better keep working. Uh -huh. And if you were going to work, you had to work for what? white people, right. probably right. the same ones who had enslaved you. Right. And do you think you were going to be paid equal to your actual expenditure in terms of work? Well, of course not. Oh. And we have a hundred year history after slavery of being what? Underpaid. Yeah. Underemployed. Underemployed. The two things that have plagued us, unemployment and underemployment. <coughs> So anyway, that's how we got to Juneteenth. People celebrate down there with red pop. We're still being played by the same things today. Oh yeah, we are. Nothing's really changed. I don't like to bring it up. We have some young people here, and I hate to even tell them how bad things are. Yeah, but they, they know. All they have to do is look around. 
Yeah. Well, a lot of them actually think things are better because you can buy knockoff clothes, buy your own music, pay $100 for a ticket to see whomsoever but down who, at the... who's making those clothes? Well, I know, but the point is people get enjoyment out of cars and clothes mm -hmm. and celebrations, and they convince themselves psychologically that they are free, but we keep struggling, but we are still behind that eight ball, meaning if you don't know what that means, it means we are pushing uphill, pushing a rock uphill. But I would predict, and I think Reverend Kemp would agree, that with a high level of spirituality and a commitment not to giving up, a true day of jubilee is just around the corner. I believe that. Yeah. I know I'm not giving up. People, let me end with this note. People call me, what's happening at DuSable? What's happening anywhere? DuSable's run like McDonald's is over on 66th and Stoney, and like that chicken place in 74th then. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. 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 No, you're right. But things are going to get right. Right, right. <laughs> the struggle continues. Yeah, the struggle, struggle continues. Continue. That's it. The struggle continues. I'm not giving up. Yeah. The forum is here today. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> International Society of Sons and Daughters of Slave Hands. Yeah, it on. still here. I'm not right. giving up. Yeah. And then, like yeah, and then ultimately, <laughs> my Lord obviously he isn't going to desert me. Right. And it's what? He has his eye on me because I'm the sparrow. Yeah. That's it. Yeah. Thank you. All right. All right. All right. Thank you. We needed that. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, indeed. And we have to remember that the ancestors had no choice but to keep on keeping on. And they had a bigger struggle than us. That's true. So, but we kind of like give up because we think the road should be smoother. But yeah. they didn't have any choice. They had to keep it moving. Right. And uh, another thing we're going to look at with the ancestors, how uh, the posture well, yeah. and the, well, the way they, they groomed themselves and yeah. how proud they posed, even though they had what? They came from slave codes, black codes, Jim Crow, oh, yeah. separate but equal. That's an everyday thing. Right. That you you know we could speak to. And uh, the hu uh, everyday humiliations. Everyday humiliations right. of being second class citizens. And just look at them. You know, you look at their eyes, you look at the dress. So it's so important for us to remember they struggled, but they were dignified, they were proud, and they knew how to have fun in spite of the struggle. Mm -hmm. right. And they reproduced. That's and why they, we're here. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> and you're going to be able to tell us all about it because it's your turn. Mm -hmm. We said in our brochure that when you come, you come with the name of an ancestor. You didn't get the brochure. She was online, okay. But this is a give and take. This is a workshop. This is the time for you are natural resources. And we have tons of information inside of us about our people. And um, we ask you to come up and put the name of your ancestors' name on there. I have 13, but I didn't have room for all my 13. And um, share a story or share a name, where they're from, if you know when they were born, where they were born, and the story. Now I'm gonna start out with my ancestor, I always start out with the model. This is Fredonia, this is my ancestor, uh, my great-grandmother, great-great-grandmother, born in 1840 in Pennsylvania County, Virginia, one of the original colonies when was that colony originated, Dr. Reed? What, Virginia? Yeah, 1607. Uh, yeah, 1607. 1607. Yeah, yeah. So she came out of Virginia. Yeah. And uh, migrated in uh, when she was nine years old with the slave owner and her mother. 
to Aberdeen, Mississippi. The lands opened up with, you don't want, you don't want. Oh, you mean with the Catons, yeah? Yeah, Mississippi, why did they migrate? Oh, oh, oh yeah, I mean, it, it, you mentioned this to me, yeah. Everybody was here on the coast, the original colony. Yeah, on the east coast. Yeah, right. but then the, they, the whites started taking land in Mississippi and Alabama, mm -hmm. Arkansas, they called it the Black Belt because the land was so rich. They could right. grow anything. Right. right. So they moved the slave labor force yeah. mm -hmm. to the west, into right. Mississippi, Alabama, Arkansas, Louisiana. My folks went from North Carolina all the way to uh, Arkansas. They're slaves. Nine years old, they had to walk. Yeah. Were they sold? Yes. Yeah, well, no, sold. they migrated, but some were sold down the river. And some had to walk on the road. Six hundred yeah. miles. Yeah. I did my research. Yeah. So the struggle continues, but guess what? She made it because that's why we here. Yeah. Okay. All of our people made it. So when we start having them pity parties. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> oh, I didn't get that Gucci ring or the watch or the this and the that. You know? uh, and we work. fall apart, we fall down, you know, just think about the ancestors. So Pat, uh, your great grandmother looks white. She's uh -uh. mixed up, she's got blue eyes. I always got, <laughs> they're writing a book on her. Yeah. And who told me that was a white lady, she was looking at Fredonia. And she says, oh, she has blue eyes. Well, I never would have known And <laughs> Young is causing trouble. <laughs> <laughs> so you know they had uh, took liberty with our people. Mary Smith was her mother, and she was born 1800. So uh, and Fredonia was born 1840, nine years old. So when you when you feel sorry for yourselves, just think of your ancestors. You know, just think of how strong they were and how they survived. So that's my story. Uh, who's next? You are, uh, we call it Papa, if you yeah. like to stand. How about this lady here? Who, who do you? Well, I know this one in the house, so I'll stop it. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Come on down, tell your story. Well, I didn't know I was going to have to tell the story, but I'll tell you what I can, can, we, can, can we see that beautiful T-shirt that you got? Can you open yeah. that up? All right. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> Juneteenth. Nice. All right. Oh. church that our people have to be educated. A lot of them have never ever heard of Juneteenth. Right, that's right. And so I decided to do a little speech at church <laughs> and talk about it, tell them about it, and get them involved in understanding something about who you are really. Okay, now what's your name? My name is Bernice Deloney. Okay. I'm a native, I was born Bernice Beard. I'm a native Tennessean, born in a, well, I was born in Jackson, Tennessee, but I grew up on the Tennessee River in a little town called Clifton, Tennessee. And that was because, luckily, my father, who was Joe Walker Beard, walked out of the cotton field one day, chopping cotton, and decided to get an education walked into Jackson, Tennessee, graduated from Lane College, and ended up as principal of Rosenhall School in Clifton, Tennessee. Oh. Now, you know, back then, we had separate and unequal schools. Right. <laughs> and Rosenhall, first they had the colored schools, then, a man named Rosenwald came through and they built the Rosenwald schools. That was Julius Rosen. Julius, Julius Rosen, Rosen, the right. president of Sears and Roebuck. Yeah, right. he came through yeah. the Rosenwald school and my father found his way from Jackson to Clifton and became principal of Rosenwald School. Okay. Okay. And that's where he was, that's where I graduated from. Back then in Clifton, like I said, we couldn't go to the same schools. So when I graduated from eighth grade, I had to be sent away to Jackson, Tennessee, 
to attend high school. 13 years old, you got to leave home to go to school. That's a lot to place on a youngster in the big city because sure. I was from the country. <laughs> and, but I made it. And uh, when you think about our ancestors, it's just overwhelming at the things that they went through. But I think about <clears throat> the things that even I went through. See, y'all don't know nothing about riding in the back of the bus. Amen. <laughs> right. Going in the back door. Right. Uh huh. Saying, uh, yes, sir. Yes, ma'am. No, ma'am. And we, in the little town, I'll tell you this little story. I don't want to say that. We had a, you had to be resourceful because they didn't play, pay black teachers much back then. So daddy had to subsidize his income the best way he could. So we had a couple of cows and we sold milk and butter. And I delivered it after I churned <laughs> one of those things like that. <laughs> and made the butter, molded it, and delivered it to the people. On Saturdays, I would go collect the money. And so this one Saturday, I went to this lady's house to collect the money. And those two white men were sitting on the porch rocking. So you have to stand there and wait till they recognize you <laughs> in order to get your money. So finally, this lady got rocking and she says, Well, girl, I guess you came to get your mama's money. I said, Yes, ma'am. Then she rocked some more. She got up and went in the house to get the money. And the other lady was rocking. She stopped rocking. She looked up at me and she said, You know, you're a cute little darky. Oh. <laughs> oh, that's a good story. So that kind of stuff is yeah. what I grew up and overcame. We, we need you to write your name. Oh, you up there it's already. Okay. You already. Okay. Can you point to it, Miss? Just point to your name where you, there she is right here. There she is. All right. Okay. That's good. Thank you. The only person you can help get. Oh, yeah, Brother Young. Yeah. Uh, I, my name is Lorenzo Young. And while I'm a third generation Bronx school resident, thanks to Professor uh, Christopher Reed and thanks to Pat especially. I'm a seeker of my heritage. Today, for the first time, I was able to pronounce my grandfather's, my great-grandfather's name. Pat, pronounce it for me. Volicious, right, come on. Volicious, Buckingham. Oh, Volicious, Buckingham. Volicious. And you count those three Bs. Okay. And so I got research because I got to find out where those names came from. Right. Interesting. Uh, that's on my father's side. And my grandmother was born in uh, Pine Bluff, Arkansas. Now, on my mother's side, uh, the Chu family, you may recall uh, Charles oh, Chu. Yeah, State Senator uh, Charles State Chu. Senator, Senator, my yeah. uncle. And my grandfather was also named Lorenzo, who had a policy ring uh, in the back of his little uh, grocery store. Mm -hmm. And he worked with the Jones brothers. So I'm learning and, and, and researching thanks to these scholars mm -hmm. that just have a passion for helping. Uh, and hopefully at our next Juneteenth celebration, I'll, I'll have more information and uh, be able to tell uh, more of the story. Thank you. Well, if you have a, if you have a name, that's good enough. I'm My name is Catherine Kim. I put one ancestor here. I'm great. 
grandfather Henry Cox of Morgan County, Georgia. Uh, I have another, I did, I have a family tree of about 900 and some odd people that I finished maybe 10 years ago. I've done family trees for other people. I've kind of gotten out of the habit of it anymore. A uh, small story about Madison, Georgia, which is in Morgan County, is that our relatives owned all the land from the city limits to the end of the county, about 300 acres, air property never to be sold for the children of the Cook and Cox families. They intermarried two sets of black people. Uh, there's a state and federal highway running through that land today. There are a couple of strip malls on it. The people in, at the courthouse told me that the deeds had burned down. Mm. One of my cousins from Atlanta and I tried to research it in the 60s. My grandfather used to pay the taxes through a white lawyer. They told him if he kept coming down on behalf of those niggers, they were going to kill him. Mm. My mother paid the taxes a little while after my grandfather died and she stopped. And I put an X signature, gave away our property. One of the things I will say to those white people is that they left a road named after us. They left one side of the street for descendants of the Cox family. And on the other side, you have these huge lots where white people live. There's still a graveyard that has our name. But basically, we have been stripped of everything we own on my mother's side. So the problem with the generations today, uh, it was air property. The first eldest child in each family was responsible. My older sister could have cared less. The problem is we now have children who care nothing about air property. Yes. And they let it go. Yes. I know people in Mississippi who have property with oil rights and standard oil right. is leasing. No one will go down and see about it. So consequently, all of that is going to be lost. So the heritage that our foreparents fought for saved their pennies and bought. I remember I got the deeds and showed how they bought the land. So it wanted to be lost because we either don't have the knowledge, right. we're doing well on our own as it is, or we just don't care. Right. So somehow we've got to get that back and we have a stake in what we own, which is in this country. Thank you. Okay.
But what was interesting was, is I was in Senegal back in the 70s, and I was dressed in uh, traditional attire, walking the streets with some African friends. And this woman on the street heard me speaking. And so she asked the African born on the continent, where is she from? She didn't this language, you know. And they said, oh, she's from America. She says, what? She looks just like the people from Mali. So she could identify me after 300 years of departure. She said, no, Mali. And I, I've been thrilled ever since. I may have been not in DNA. And she confirmed what I had already researched. So you're looking at a bombard. <laughs> Can you identify the organization you belong to that helps train you to do genealogical work? Uh, yes, the the, the, the genealogy yeah, that, is the uh, African, uh, Afro-American uh, historical and AAGHSC. That's what's the African-American genealogical and historical society of Chicago. When, when did they meet and where did they meet? Yeah. Where did they oh, yeah. meet? Every second Sunday at the Action Center on 79th and I don't know what that is. Oh, yeah, that's the second Sunday. Yeah, from Jeffrey. Yeah, in, it's before mm -hmm. the, uh, the new tip. Yeah, I know what the Action Center is. The Action Center. Yeah. I didn't know it was only on Sunday. Yeah, hey, then there's another one, Patricia Liddell Researchers. They meet every fourth Saturday uh, at the Woodson Regional Library. What time? Both of them start at 1 30. And it's good to be in a group because it motivates you mm -hmm. to be around people who are interested in their heritage. Mm -hmm. and, sure and, and, and yeah, and they give you hints. I have gotten so many uh, hints on uh, my ancestors just by knowing, they knowing that I, I, I'm doing research in Mississippi, Aberdeen, Mississippi. I just went there and I came back and I found this and I found my people, Fredonia's people as a result of that. So that was the media AGSC's meeting. It's good to be in good company. Research, research driven. Florida, and we were, he's from like Tallahassee, Quincy 
area, and we were um, traveling, and I saw this street or this town named Alfred, Georgia. So, I mean, I didn't get a chance to go there or anything, but, um, you know, it's got to be something there. Right. Um, the other part, I feel Schubert, which is my mother's um, maiden name. Actually, my mother is right across the street over at the hospital today, and I just decided to come and take a break and join you guys here this afternoon. But um, her family um, goes way back to Holly Springs, Mississippi, which is where uh, her and my father met. But um, as I don't know if the rest of my family, there's some of us cousins um, that are interested in um, learning more about our history. But as I'm sitting here listening to people who know, I, I just feel a little sad because I think as time goes on, you know, people are not embracing their history. Um, I think about, I, I'm the grandmother now of twin boys, and my daughter did decide to put um, her grandfather's name and one of his brothers, they had like nine. My grandmother had nine kids, not 21, as originally she was I, I guess I'm just thinking it's so important to try to hold on to all of that, as much of it as you can. And when you talk about the land, my husband right now is um, in Florida trying to take care of some business. And like you said, you know, his siblings are just not participating in holding on. I think me, I'm a scholar. My father, my father um, went to um, Mississippi Industrial High um, mm -hmm. College. He went to MIT. You have to go to Holly Springs. You got Russ on this side, and the MI campus is still sitting there, but it's been closed for years. But my father and I are the real academics of the family, so as time has gone along, I have really learned so much about our heritage. And you talk about all the pride that these people are showing. I mean, it's just phenomenal. Like, I'm just learning about Black Wall Street. I'm just learning about so many historical things that, I mean, even the names of the schools in our um, community. I'm born and raised here in Chicago. Mm -hmm. You know, how many of our children are really embracing all of the that's history right. that's behind that's right. all of the names of the schools and things like that? And I just, it just saddens me. I'm, I'm still a teacher. I try to teach as much as I can. And I think that, you know, it's just so important. But, um, you know, some of this will never capture. Like my mother would say, oh, that stuff ain't important. I mean, and then there's all these little secrets in the family that don't, people don't want to talk about. And all that. <laughs> so it's like, but it's just important to know who you are. Right. And, um, you know, along with all of the, the sad stories, like the different shame and all of that is, you know, what is what makes us a very strong people. So and we overcome. Oh, absolutely. Oh, absolutely. every day. Exactly. Absolutely. Jim Crawford. Um, Jim Crawford. Yeah. Um, I didn't realize that you was actually bringing that. So I don't have the name. So um, I my mother's side, they are from Clayton, Alabama, okay. and my maternal grandmother, my maternal grandmother said she remembers her grandmother, um, her great-grandmother telling her she remembers the day that they freed them in Alabama. Oh. Uh, so that family is in, uh, was from Clayton, Alabama, which is Barber County, and actually until about 2002, we owned 80 acres of land. And as he suggested, they cut down the tree, mm -hmm. sold the tree, and then sold the land to the um, state of Alabama because if they didn't sell it, then they would have um, yeah. taken eminent domain over yeah. it, so they would have had it sold. Um, on my father's side, as you can see, they're from Crawford County, which is where my last name came from, and they actually can go back pretty far um, with our ancestry because they stayed in that same area and are living, still living um,
you know the lady rang and called out Dorian Johnson? Uh, I, I believe think, I have heard. I think they, they had Crawfords. Mm -hmm. And, and it's, it's in a, 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 it is in a history book. Uh, do, do we have a sign in sheet? Yeah. Uh, and I'll contact you. So, and what we have been told is that pretty much anyone who has that last name Crawford is related. Is okay because my uh, husband's people are Crawfords. Okay, so they out of Mississippi and Georgia. Georgia, yeah. So that's what we've been told is pretty much any last name that comes Johnson outside. Good afternoon. My name is Martha Bada. I was born and raised here in Chicago. I haven't been able to trace my family back past my grandparents. I have a cousin who saw my father's name on the 1910 census. And that's about as far as I can go back. I do know the names of my grandfathers. My father's father's name was John Hughes. My mother's father's name was William Johnson. He was from Georgia. And Mr. Hughes was from Arkansas. Um, our family migrated up here. I don't know how. I wasn't told. And here I am, but I'm very grateful that I'm here with you this afternoon. I've learned so much. And I will be back again. Thank you. The Holy Spirit told me I had to uh, share my great great grandfather, Ernest Linwood Hackworth. Uh, he worked. Uh, he was born in 1858, signed by the maid and the master mm -hmm. uh, in uh, West Point, no words, West Point, Mississippi. Wow. <laughs> and uh, one of the stories that has been passed down is that. Uh, he was passing for life. He had three uh, three wives. Whoa. And three wives. <laughs> That's not a I mean, he married three times. <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh. Yeah, he was. Uh, so his first wife was um, Ozella, and uh, well, his third wife was my great, our great grandmother, Katie. Had, uh, parish Hackworth. And the first child that they had together in 1890 was named for his second wife, <laughs> Ozella. You see why it's hard to remember all of this. So that's why the name Ozella has been passed down in our family, but it was the second wife. So you knew who was in charge at any time that my great grandmother, her first child is named after his second wife. He was in charge. What? Yeah. Yeah, that 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 was a lot of nerve. Yeah. That's one that's my point. And then the other piece to that um, is that he when he was working, had to find a job, he worked uh, as on a riverboat. And uh, a white man recognized him and said, that's E.L. Hackworth's son. He's black. So he was fired. <laughs> so, so that's the story on E.L. Hackworth. And this is, uh, this is the uh, one that uh, Julia Snowden, which I met oh. as a little girl mm. in uh, Chicago. She lived in Robbins, Illinois. Oh, yeah. yeah. Robbins. She was 100 years old. She was born in 1851 oh. uh, in Columbus, Georgia, mm. and died in Robbins, Illinois in 1951. And our father used to take us uh, to visit her uh, in Robbins, Illinois, and she lived with her, her uh, daughter, Julia, also named Julia. And Yolanda, my sister, is named after Julia. Mm -hmm. And uh, she used to sell pies uh, after slavery, tell and uh, sold pies 
and she also was a, a psychic reader. She used to, they used to walk down the street or asking people that they want their fortune told. So that's an interesting little tale. It is. Really. Yeah. Yeah. So everybody's got a little personality stories mm -hmm. about the people to help them come alive, and they were real people. That's correct. Okay, we're going to finish up with a video, uh, 1999, when we first started Sun Story Slave Ancestry. Uh, we asked uh, members of the society, uh, AGSC and PLR, to turn in their pictures of their ancestors mm -hmm. and to commemorate 134 years uh, since the end of slavery at that time. So this, you will see a collection, of our very first collection of pictures, of the pictures that they turned in that they held on for years and years. Glory, glory, hallelujah. Oh, 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 glory, glory, hallelujah. Glory, glory, hallelujah. As we go marching on, we are calling Yankee soldiers who enlisted for. Yeah, bro. 